say, yes, Lord, we wanna receive from You, Holy Spirit, come and speak through the truth of Your Word, through the power of Your Word. We pray that each one of us would be fertile soil to receive everything that You want to deposit and that in that place, more than that, that it would be watered, that it would grow, that it would turn into 30, 60, 100, a huge harvest in Jesus' Name. We pray that no one misses out this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, that You would come and speak into the most unique places, Father, that as You speak this morning, things would be broken off people, healing would come, that the power of Your Word would truly transform in a way that only You can do, Lord. And so we say thank You for this time. We give it to You as our act of worship this morning in Jesus' Name. And I wanna just continue to pray for a moment as we're gathered together as the church. Father, we lift up Israel to You today. Father, we see the devastation that is taking place over there. We, we, we pray for both Israel, we pray for the Palestinians, we pray for a mighty move of God, Lord. We pray that Jesus, You would come and fall on that whole place that thousands and thousands and thousands of people would turn to You in Jesus' Name. We pray for miracles in Jesus' Name. Lord, I pray for those hostages We cover them and pray that they would be returned safely in Jesus' Name. Lord, Your Word commands us to pray for the peace of Israel. We pray that evil would be stamped out and that You would be glorified in Jesus' mighty Name. Amen. Just before I get into it, I have to give a shout out to my brother Austin down here in the second row. He flew up from Sydney, went to Malulaba Beach to worship with the crew that were gathered yet there yesterday and was baptised in the ocean yesterday. I've prayed for him already this morning, but I know that God has great things for you, brother. And I just see this boldness coming out of you. It's the light of Jesus and it's gonna transform the lives of people around you. And sometimes we think that those closest to us are the hardest people for us to witness to. I believe that in your case, they're gonna be the ones who see what God does in your life and they're gonna turn to Him. And you're gonna see salvations in your family and your friendships in Jesus. Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to get into the Word now. I'm bringing you a message today. It's called Praying with the Windows Open. Praying with the Windows Open. We're going to read a lot of Scripture this morning. You can turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 6. I thought that on a day that was all about the Haddons, I'd preach on a book of the Bible called Daniel and just try and get some attention back if that was possible. I believe, I I really believe God's got something to say to people today and it's not going to be me with fancy words. It's going to be the power of His Word that speaks to our hearts today. Daniel chapter 6, are you there? It says, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself, I got there, among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, I'm gonna give you a bit of background as we jump into this. In 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar... Okay, I can't talk today. (laughs) 
I can't hear either. And uh, I could just burst out coughing at any stage. But hang in there with me. King Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem. And what they did was they captured a whole stack of people. Their model was to take the best of the best first and exile them. So they took them back to Babylon. And the Babylonians had this process where they would essentially attempt to delete the identity of the Israelites and then consume them in their Babylonian culture. They wanted to push away anything of the old and change them into the new in Babylon. And the amazing thing about Daniel is that Daniel was able to maintain his integrity through this process He was able to honour God through the whole process. And more than that, as a mighty leader, he was able to get the king's attentions and he served many of the kings of Babylon. And he did very, very well. He prospered as he served the Lord in that way. And so here is the king and he's planning to make Daniel a ruler over the whole kingdom of Babylon. This is a big deal. Remember, he's an exile, right? Verse four says, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Now, I want to tell you this here. This is why he annoyed other leaders because they knew if Daniel got into power and because he was an honest person and he was a man of integrity, that their profits were going to be cut because they obtained most of them illegally, that he would put an end to them and it was going to change. They were going to have to move from lobster just down to um, sandwiches, you know, Vegemite sandwiches, right? They could see it coming. And so they were scared of what Daniel would do. Verse 5, finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors and governors have all agreed, not Daniel, but they still said all, all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any God or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den." Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, if you think about this, what the administrators proposed to the king was actually a brilliant idea. Because not only did it put Daniel in a really difficult position, it also put him in a position where they could show the king that he was not loyal to him. And that was a big deal. It also appealed to the king's sense of pride, that they would come to him and say, for 30 days, people can only pray to you. Essentially, they were saying, you are a God. And the king would have said, yes, I am. It'll be great to have the people just worshipping me. This is what should happen. Now, the other thing about this is that it was easy to see that while people were forced in the kingdom to bow down, that this would create the opportunity for those who did not follow the orders to stand out. And they knew that Daniel would be standing out. Right? We think, man, this is a crazy idea. It sounds like people saying that you can't sing in church or something like that. But anyway, let's, let's keep continue and we'll see what Daniel does. All right, verse 10. It says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, 
He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. The laws could not be changed once they were set in motion. Verse 13, then, the king, and then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of your exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the degree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel, and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. Daniel chapter 6 presents us with this clash between culture and and faith. Now, I don't believe that this is a prescriptive text in any way. I don't think that we're meant to read this scripture and just copy what Daniel did in similar situations. But I do think that we get to look at this and consider how we can navigate these situations when they arise in our lives, this clash, this collision of faith and culture. Daniel had to decide whether he was going to stand for his spiritual convictions or whether he would bow to cultural demands. And I want you to hear this, that if you're here today and we want to put ourselves into the story, then we have to ask these same questions. Are we going to stand for our spiritual convictions or are we going to bow to cultural demands. And maybe you're here today and you say, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And I want you to know that this still applies to you, that you might have values, you might have things in your life that you believe are important, but there will be times where culture comes and pushes back against those things. And you have to make that decision. Are you gonna stand for those things that you value and believe are important or are you gonna bow to culture? We all have these challenges, all right? But this is not a new thing. This has been happening right through history. Culture and faith have rarely agreed and moved in the same direction. Here's what it looks like, is that God says do this and culture says do this. God says say this And culture says, say that. God says, here's who I've created you to be. And culture says, here's who we want you to be, right? God says, I want you to live this way. Culture says, I want you to live this way. And maybe you've already experienced this. Maybe you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you're going through it right now. Excuse me. Maybe it was. Uh, maybe it's related to your work that you have been told certain things that you can and cannot do that have challenged your faith. You felt that pressure of culture in some ways. Maybe you're a uni student, and I have no doubt I went to uni as well. 
and I remember what that was like. And there is no doubt that if you're living for Jesus in that context, that you are going to feel the pressure and the pull of culture in certain situations. And if you are a follower of Jesus and a parent in this room, then I know you are feeling this at times. Has anyone ever heard this from one of your children? But dad, everyone else's parents let them do it. Anyone here, right? That is faith and culture colliding right there. This is real for us. If we want to lighten this up a little bit, then it can be as simple as busyness. That culture says, go, go, go. Don't stop. And so you get to Sunday and you're even thinking, I don't have time to go to church. I've got a thousand things to do. When it comes to finances, culture will tell you what to do with your money. And I promise you this, that it's not going to be generosity. It definitely won't be give to the church in any way. Amen. We are all caught up in these situations at times. And the truth is that they can be hard. And I believe this, I believe that the closer we get to the return of Jesus, that this is going to become more and more difficult. This will become realer and realer for us on a daily basis. I have a family member right now who challenges us on every decision that we make for Jesus. They cannot understand it and they don't agree with it. And I get that. It doesn't make sense to them. But this is the reality of the world that we live in. And I want you to hear this, is that we, if we are living God's way, then we will be constantly challenged by the culture around us. If you're not, then you need to think about how much you are pressing in to the Jesus way of living. So I have three thoughts just to share from this chapter. Number one, God's way must become our way. God's way must become our way. So Daniel's first response when he heard the news was to pray, was to go and pray just like he'd always done three times a day. And it says, the Scripture said that in his room with the windows that opened towards Jerusalem, he would pray three times a day. Now, I want you to know this. Daniel knew that Israel had been taken over. He knew that Jerusalem had been decimated. He knew that the temple had been destroyed. And yet I believe that he got in that prayer room and he prayed looking towards Jerusalem like he always did because he knew that even though those things had changed, God had not changed. And he was going to continue to look to God for everything that he needed. And I wonder what that looks like for you and I. As these situations arise, as we're pressured from parenting, as we're pressured to make these decisions, is our first response to go to the place where we put it before the Lord and we say, God, I see this situation, but I know that even though things have changed, you haven't changed. And I look to you on how to move forward with these things. This is who we need to be as followers of Jesus. You know, I believe that while Daniel was in that place and he was praying, that that's where the Lord spoke to him. How did Daniel know that he would continue to do that? How did he know that he would leave the windows open so people would see that he is continuing to stand for Jesus? I believe as he came before the Lord in his usual time of prayer, that that's where God met him and said, here's what I want you to do. This is what every one of us needs This is what a relationship with the Father looks like. Now you realise how big this is. In that place, the Lord said to Daniel, here's what I want you to do. Daniel continued in his ways, knowing that it would mean he was going to get fed to lions. This is a big deal. He just got the top job. Man, there was a Lamborghini. He'd already ordered it. It was on its way with a new paycheck. And yet he 
He comes and He meets with the Lord. And we don't get to read it, I understand that. But something took place as He met with the Lord, enough to know, here's how I'm gonna stand, even knowing this is what it will mean. We need to be people who do that. We need to be growing in our understanding of the life that God is calling us to live. We've been singing about this this morning, Matthew 7, 24. Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Number one, God's way must become our way. Number two, God's way puts us in a spiritual battle. You know, when we choose God's way, you are gonna find that the enemy wants to stop you living that way. Something that we see the enemy doing so broadly and so regularly right now is this spirit of intimidation coming over people and it, the enemy gets in their ear and it causes them to be confused about who they are, the way that God's calling them to live what He requires of them. The spirit of intimidation causes people to doubt what God is saying, what they're doing. It holds them back from stepping into the fullness of God. And I want you to hear this. If you are gonna live God's way, then you are stepping into a spiritual battle. But here is the great news is that as you do that, you will get to see that God is greater and that in His power, we get to see the works of the enemy destroyed. And as we hear that voice and we say, rack off, I'm not listening to you, I'm going with what my Father says, then in those moments we have victory and we get to give God glory. God's way puts us in a spiritual battle. Number three, God's way means He is number one. Number one above everything. Daniel was being asked to worship the king as a God. Now, now listen to this. The decree was only for 30 days. 30 days. Like he could have easily just thought 30 days, I can do that. He might have even thought, as I bow down and worship the King, I'm gonna secretly be be pray to my God, the one true God, right? Oh, King, praise the Lord God, He's the one true King. Oh, we worship you, right? 30 days. Surely he thought, maybe I can survive that. Maybe I could just give in and go with the flow here. Maybe it's not that big a deal. Maybe God would understand but he didn't. There was no way he was gonna worship a false God. And I want you to hear this this morning. It is time for you and I to remove anything from our lives that is an idol, that is a false God that might be pulling us away from the things that God has for us. I know that you might think this is a bit extreme, but What are we giving our time to? Facebook, Instagram, Netflix. What are these things that we're worshipping? Success, money, wealth, all these things. These are the little gods in our lives that fight for that top position of great big God. And before we know it, we're bowing down and we're worshipping to these things. And we're joining culture all around us as we do it. But I want you to hear this, that when you come to the one true living God, there is no room for any other gods. It is only Him and we lay everything down before Him. It's time to strip away. It's time to get rid of anything that pulls us away from our God. All right, so let's have a look at how this plays out. Daniel 6 verse 19. He says at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. Who has a lion's den, by the way? (laughs) 
great king. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God. How would you like that description to be you from someone who doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, that they would come and say, Toby, servant of the living God, that they would see that, identify that in you. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the King live forever. My God sent His angel and He shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in His sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, Your Majesty. The King was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel, this is a bit gruesome, this is like the R-rated part right here, okay? (laughs) Cover your ears if you're not okay with this stuff. The men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Isn't this a fantastic ending? (laughs) I mean that Daniel got saved, right? But I wanna make this disclaimer. I wanna be the bad guy here today and tell you that this is how it worked out for Daniel. He didn't get eaten by the lions, that's great news, but that doesn't mean that that's how it always will work out for us. I wish I could tell you that if you put your trust in God and go His way, then everything is just going to go well for you, that you're going to flourish and prosper and only good things will happen, but that simply isn't the truth and it's not what the Bible teaches us. I really want to be clear today, sometimes the good guys get eaten by lions. Sometimes we get shipwrecked. Sometimes we might get a little banged up, a little cut up. Sometimes we might lose the job. Sometimes it might cost us the friendship. Sometimes we might lose the money. Sometimes things may not go our way. Sometimes we may end up with a bad name. People may say things about us. Sometimes it will just not work out the way that we had hoped and that we had prayed. But while we may have a desired outcome, like not being eaten by lions, not losing our job, The outcome is not in our hands. The outcome is in God's hands. And no matter who we are, what we're looking at, we are called to follow Him and to trust Him with the outcome. And we trust that even when we don't understand, He is good and He will get the glory through what He's doing. Let me show you what that looks like. Verse 25, it says, And King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. This was before email. This is a big job. He said, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For He is the living God and He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and He saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heaven and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. 
when God gets the glory, it means that the world sees Jesus and not us. Burp and Gary doesn't need to know about a hero named Dan, this really good looking guy, <laughs> funny. Burp and Gary doesn't need to know about him. Burp and Gary needs to know about Jesus, the one who can save them. Australia doesn't need to know about this amazing church or these amazing people. Australia needs to know about Jesus so they can be set free in Jesus' Name. Japan doesn't need to know about this amazing family called the Haddons. They're wonderful, we love them. God is in them, He's using them. Japan needs to hear the Name of Jesus and be able to respond to the Gospel that will change all eternity for them. So what does it look like when God gets the glory? It's when it goes to Him and not us. And that's what we live for. Now we will end up in this religious headspace if we take a message like this and we break it down to just doing all the right things. Tick, 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 I'm a saint, I'm a saint, I'm perfect. I think, say, do all the right things, done. Now, if we live that way, we will totally disconnect with the heart of the Father. But what if we come and we surrender our heart and we say, God, because of who you are and what you've done for me, I wanna give you everything and I'm gonna live your way. You know, Jesus always brought it back to the heart. One example, Matthew 5, 27, He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It'd be easy just to bypass the heart and to try and do all the right things. But the heart is what the Father wants. I want my obedience to come from a deep belief in who God is, a deep belief that He is everything, that there is no one and nothing that is more important than Him. And because of that, I will surrender everything to Him. I wanna get the team up. We're gonna worship in just a moment. I wanna finish with one little story. Um, some people here know that before I was a pastor, I actually, I was a cable joiner working for Energex. And I loved that job, favourite job. I know when we drive past, we just see them leaning on shovels. There's work that gets done at times. I want you to know that. This one day, we were working on a project, working on some electrical equipment on the side of the road. And as we were work, working away, this car kind of abruptly drove up to us and the door flung open and this, this elderly man jumped out of the car and he stumbled over to us and he was holding his chest and he was able to say, like, my heart, my heart. And we realised instantly this guy, is, he's having a heart attack. This is not good. He fell down on the footpath and... I'm there with a the crew and so we, we all stop what we're doing and we run over to this man and someone calls the ambulance and it's a hot day and he's lying on the footpath. So a few of the guys go and they get umbrellas and someone got their raincoat and put it under his head and they're just looking after this guy. And as I'm standing there watching, I see him, he's starting to turn this weird colour. Like he's, he's, he's turning grey. And I think to myself, like, this man is going to die right here now in front of us. And, and the Lord just grips my heart and He says, 
damn, like, what are you going to do? And I think, oh my goodness, I, like I need to pray for this guy. I need, to, I need to care. I need to show this guy the love of Jesus right now. And then there's like this other voice going on as well. And, and I'm thinking, man, that like, I know, like the guys in my crew, they knew I was a Christian, but this, is, this would be weird. Like they'd be like, what the heck's going on here? And I'm wrestling with this fear of what they would think. And as I'm thinking through this, I'm watching this man just continue to change colour and his, the life is just fading out of his body. And so I said, stuff it. And I just pushed through these two guys and, and I got down on my knees with this guy and I grabbed his hand and I asked him what his name was. And I, I think it was Michael from memory. And, and I said, Michael, my name's Dan. And, uh, I'm a follower of Jesus and I would love to pray for you now. Is that okay with you? And he said, Dan, I'll take everything you've got. Now it's cosy, right? The rest of the crew are all there. We're in like two metres squared. They're holding the umbrellas to keep me cool while I minister to this guy. So I laid hands on his chest and I prayed for healing to come in Jesus' Name. And as I'm praying, I'm not gonna suggest that he was healed, but as I'm praying, the colour starts to return and he says, I'm actually feeling better. And I was kind of surprised too. I'm like, hey, that's cool. (laughs) Anyway, I'm still sitting there and I'm holding his hand. And then I think, if he dies, I wonder if he knows Jesus. And so we're all there together and I just say to him, I say, Michael, I'm a follower of Jesus. Has anyone ever told you about Jesus? He says, yeah, actually, I was told about Jesus when I was young. And so I said, okay, well, here's what I believe. Jesus has changed my life. And I went on to share the gospel with him and tell him, I believe, you know, Jesus has died for you so that you can know him as your Saviour. And so we're sitting there chatting. I'd love to say that I gave him an opportunity to raise his hand on the count of three. But I didn't. And just as I'm coming to the end of that, the ambulance rocks up and we move aside and they put him on a stretcher and they take Michael away. Now, my heart is going a million miles a second. Like I am pumped, right? And then there's this other side of me that's thinking, whoa, that was kind of full on. I wonder what the rest of the lads are thinking, right? Anyway, we get back to work. This is as if nothing had happened. Later in the afternoon, one of the older men in our crew gives me this little, like, and I'm like, I have no idea what he's talking about, right? So I'm like, coming over and I'm like, yo. And he goes like, that was pretty cool, you know, what happened there today. And I'm like, yeah, tell me about it. And he goes, you know, like, It's weird because I've been thinking lately that once I used to know Jesus, but I haven't lived for Him for a really long time. And I've actually been thinking about whether I should start living for Him again. And he goes, listening to you today, I think that was a sign from God that I need to give everything back to Him. And I said, I think so too. Now, I would love to say that we got word back from the hospital and Michael got a new heart and, you know, he went on to become an AFL player and play for Collingwood and win the Premiership. (laughs) I don't know what happened to Michael. But here's here's what I want you to hear today. As, As we look at this amazing chapter in the Bible and think, well, Lord, what have you got for me in this? I want you to see this. Daniel chose to pray with the windows open. And I believe that God is calling us to live in a way that the world gets to see Jesus in us. We are His hands and His feet. 
And if we close the windows, if we block this light that's in us out, then the world doesn't get to see Him. I believe God is calling each and every one of us to be a people who pray with the windows open, that nothing would get in the way of the world seeing that we are followers of Jesus and we live God's way, no matter what culture says. Can I get you to jump on your feet? There's no doubt in my mind that it doesn't take great faith to be able to live this way. To be someone who says yes to everything that the Lord has, to lay down our own agendas, to put His way number one. And so this morning, I just wanna pray. And maybe you're in a season right now where you're thinking, this is me, like I am under the pump with this stuff and I need God's help to be able to equip me, to strengthen me. I wanna have faith that as I do this, I'm gonna get to give God glory for who He is. So I just wanna invite you to stretch your hands out in front of you. And Father, we just thank You Thank You for who You are, God. Thank You for what You've done. Thank You for Your incredible love for us, Lord. We thank You, God, that there is no greater God than You, Father. We thank You that while everything in this world wants to say that they are number one, that this is number one, Father, that You are the way, the truth and the life. There is no one who comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ, that You are above everything, Lord, that You hold the whole world in Your hands, Father. And God, we pray that as we are people, who go after Your heart, who long to live Your way, Father, that You fill us full of faith, God, that You would give us strength, God, that all our days we will worship You in surrender and that as we do that, God, that You will get the glory. We pray that for Burp and Gary, Father. We pray that for Queensland. We pray that for Australia. We pray that for the nations. We pray that over Japan, Father. We pray that over our world today, Lord, that there would be a move of God so powerful that we see You get great glory. We pray this in Jesus' mighty Name. Amen.